go ahead and get started. So we're done with Soph Sophocles. Might make reference, you know, <coughs> to a couple of the plays. But we're starting Shakespeare. Um, two plays by Shakespeare we're gonna cover, Midsummer Night's Dream and Hamlet. They're gonna take quite a while. Uh, I'm gonna try to get try to get us a little bit back on schedule because I know we're two, three days behind, something like that. <coughs> Make sure you read the introduction on pages 1171 to 1180 to not only Shakespeare's background, but the background of Shakespeare's theater, the theater in the Middle Ages, etc. cetera. Um, a comment about that. There are three major, I guess you could call it periods, of drama. First one is classical, Greek and Roman. The second one is, um, for lack of a better term, call it the, Rena the Renaissance. That's a five. Fifteenth century to, uh, sorry, sixteenth century to the mid 17th century and the third one would really be the modern period 19th century to today um, what's kind of interesting about these two the classical and the renaissance is they both ultimately have their origins in religion okay talked a little bit i think about the origins of the Greek theater being in the Dionysian festivals and revels and such. Shakespeare's theater, even though, you know, I've got here 16th century, theater dies out at the end of the Roman period, roughly 4th century, very early 5th century AD, okay? No drama going on for at least five or 600 years. It begins again sometime in the early 14th century, I believe it is. Might be late 13th century. And it begins in the Catholic Church in England. And it starts, or it, or it begins, um, during the preparation for Easter. I don't remember if your book mentions this or not. But it begins with this trope or question, quem quiertis, which means, you know, where have they laid? And the way it starts is in the church, in, in the preparation for crucifixion, resurrection, primarily resurrection, you have readings from the Bible, or you had readings from the Bible. And one of those readings would be when the women disciples run to the tomb of Jesus and they see the stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty. And they ask the gardener, who they assume is a gardener, where have they left, where have they laid our Lord? And the gardener says, he is not here. This is according to Mark's gospel, I believe. He is not here. He's gone before you into Galilee. Go seek him there. The origins of English drama begin right there. It's a very, very short passage, and it's two people in a church reading antiphonally, that is, one person says something and the other person responds, just this little short passage. And that gradually develops into people kind of acting out those lines, and then it gets larger. And then your book goes on and talks about the three different kinds of English plays, mystery plays, miracle plays, morality plays. Read about that. We don't have time to uh, go over it. Those come out of that early um, I don't want to say production. It's not production. 
that early practice in the Catholic Church around 1300 or so okay, in England. By the time we get to Shakespeare, you have real plays being produced, not Shakespeare's kind of plays, but we have real um, other plays, and I just remember a couple other dates I need to put down. Five seventy six. Drawing a blank on the exact date for some reason. So jump up to Shakespeare himself. Shakespeare's born on or around fifteen um, April twenty third, fifteen sixty four. We only say on or around because we don't have his birth certificate. There are birth certificates from this time period. There's birth certificates going back to the Middle Ages. Okay? Shakespeare's is missing. We do have, if I remember correctly, a baptismal certificate. It gives us the date of his baptism. That's what causes most scholars to generally assume this is his birth date. Okay? Interestingly, he dies April 23rd, 1616. Dies on his birthday. If April 23rd is his actual birthday. So notice, 36 years in 16, Shakespeare was only 52 when he died. Okay? Think of what he accomplished in that 52 years. Well, let's take out the first, I don't know, 20 years? Um, now I'd say take out the first 26 years. So in the last 26 years of his life, or possibly even the last 20 to 22, because he leaves London in 1612, 1613, and goes back to Stratford. Doesn't write anything else for the last three or four years of his life. We don't know when he begins writing. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a moment. His father is a somewhat prosperous wool merchant and such, um, leather worker in Stratford. He eventually will become mayor. He's an alderman. He will eventually become mayor. It's during his term in office that Parliament issues a rule kind of um, against images in the church, icons and iconography and such, and it becomes his responsibility to see to it that the Guildhall Church in central Stat Stratford, Stratford, sorry, I've been there, um, that the religious images on the wall all get painted over. Okay? And he does. He does have them whitewashed. But it's pretty clear from what you can see today and from what descriptions tell us his heart wasn't in it that is covering up this imagery because you can see the images through the whitewash. Okay? Um, I think it's pretty convincing. Not, not all scholars agree on this, but I think it's pretty convincing. Shakespeare's family was Catholic. All right? Whether Shakespeare was, in terms of personal real beliefs and devotion and all that kind of stuff, it's unclear. He's not a he's not a Puritan. Okay, um, he might be Protestant. He might have some Protestant leanings, but he's not a Puritan. He's not you know throw out all Catholic imagery, throw out all the saints and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to um, Hamlet. In 1582. Shakespeare marries Anne Hathaway. He's 18, she's 26. Okay. At this time, for two people to get married, the church required what are called <clears throat> the bands to be read. The bands was <coughs> essentially a short statement 
read by the local rector, priest, pastor of a church, three successive Sundays prior to the marriage day, the wedding day. And the bands are essentially William Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway plan to be married on. Okay? If anyone knows any reason why they should not get married, let him or her stand up now and give the reason. It's kind of like in, you know, the, the general kind of popular conscious Protestant wedding ceremony. If anyone knows any reason why they should not get married, let him speak now or forever, forever hold his peace. Okay? In November of 1582, Shakespeare got a license, a wedding license, to marry Anne Hathaway. Now, that wasn't required at the time. Now, in the United States, you have to get a wedding license, a marriage license to get married. It wasn't required at the time unless one particular thing wasn't done. And that's the reading of all the bands. Apparently, only one of the bands was read. The first one. They didn't do it in the NX2. We're not sure why. Okay, um, They got married, or the wedding license at least, was not for the county of Warwick where Shakespeare was from. That's where Stratford-upon-Avon is from. Okay. The town he was born in and the town he died in is Stratford-upon-Avon. It's Stratford and it sits upon the River Avon. Okay. So they get married. Six months later, they have their first child. Probably why the bands weren't finished. Probably why they got the wedding license. Anne Hathaway was already pregnant. Okay? And notice, she's 26. To be 26 and unmarried in Shakespeare's day, for a woman, not for a man, double standard, first one to admit it, that's old spinster. I mean, that's like beyond marrying age almost. We have no idea how they met. We have, we have really very, very little information about Shakespeare's childhood or his adolescent years. Right? Her family was somewhat well-to-do, somewhat well-off. Um, her, her mother's name was Mary Arden, and just outside Stratford there is an Arden Forest. As You Like It, another play by Shakespeare, much of the action occurs in the Forest of Arden. It's not necessarily the same one. It's thought that that may actually be over in France where the Ardennes uh, essentially is. So, their daughter Susanna is born in May of 1583. Right? Two years later, year and a half actually, this is like, I don't know, it's the end of May, May 26th or something like that. February 2nd of 1585, their twins, Hamnet, not Hamlet, Hamnet, and Judith are born. Hamnet dies, uh, if I remember correctly, in 1596. So he dies at 11. From 1585 to 1592, <clears throat> you have what are variously called by scholars either the lost years or the dark years. And what is meant by that is in February 1585, we have the birth certificates for these two. We know they were born. And then we have no documentary evidence at all about Shakespeare from February of then until 1592. There's no reference to him at all, anywhere. 
in, in all the documents that had been read from that period. Now, I will tell you, when, when I was working on my doctorate and I was a, uh, a textual assistant to this edition of poetry, I did research in libraries in London, et cetera, and a few years after that, um, there are an awful lot of manuscripts and primarily manuscripts that are cataloged in these big major libraries at Oxford and Cambridge, the British Library in London, et cetera, where they get a curious kind of entry in the catalog. It just says, you know, a collection of 16th century texts. And that's because somebody hasn't actually read through every page of those manuscripts and possibly from when they were first written. All they know is that these are texts from the 16th century. There may be references in some of that stuff that's not been read in 100 years, 100 years to Shakespeare in 1588. But if there is, it hasn't been discovered, all right? In 1592, this guy, Robert Greene, who's dying, he dies in September of 1592, he writes this pamphlet called A Groat's Worth, G-R-O-A-T-S, Worth, of Wit, with a Million of Repentance. A groat is a um, unit of money. It's like a penny. All right? So a penny's worth of wit, essentially, and a million, that is a million pounds, whatever, worth of repentance. All right? And in this... He alludes to this, well, he's taking shots at popular writers. That is, he's taking shots at people whose works are better received than his. Okay? He's what's called, he's older, but he is what gets called later a university wit. And what that means is he attended university, and he kind of makes his living by writing, by his wits, okay? And he writes a bunch of stuff that nobody reads at all. Now, we do know Shakespeare used one of his stories as a source after he was dead, all right? So, he writes this, and in it, he alludes to Shakespeare. And we know it is an allusion to Shakespeare because he has this comment about a tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide. He makes this reference to this person, okay? That is almost an exact quote from Shakespeare's third part of Henry VI play, which reads in this line, Act 1, Scene 4, line 137, a tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide. So he quotes the line, but changes it just slightly. In, in the play, Shakespeare's talking about a woman who has, you know, this kind of um, hidden ferocious nature. What Green is doing, it's not a woman who has that, it's a player. Who has that kind of nature. In a few lines below that, he refers to, you know, these writers who, you know, are a shake scene in a country. Shake, Shakespeare. Everybody reads that. As he's without naming his so-called opponent, that he's talking about Shakespeare. He's really jealous. Okay, that tells us two things. That when he writes that, one, Shakespeare's already written this play. And it's already, if it hasn't been produced, it's at least been seen by Green. But it's implied that it's been produced. That is, the play has been performed. It's supposedly one of Shakespeare's earliest plays. It's the third part. That means parts one and two have already been written. So Shakespeare's been in London 
We don't know how long, but he's been in London writing. His plays have been performed, and he's already making a name for himself. But again, 1585 to 92 are the dark years or the lost years because prior to this publication, we don't have any reference. So it's safe to assume he's probably in London by 1590. There's just no reference to him. And he's probably already written some of his earliest plays, like Titus Andronicus, Comedy of Errors. Those are among two of his earliest plays. These, okay? So, question a lot of students will frequently ask is, well, what about his wife and kids? They're back in Stratford this whole time. And we don't have any indication, except for a couple of times when, in the mid-1590s, Shakespeare is going to apply for a coat of arms for his father, so that his father will be considered a gentleman. You have to have a coat of arms to rise to that level. Um, other than that, he doesn't go back to Stratford. He buys some property. He might have been present for that, okay? So, we do know that by the time, shortly after this, Shakespeare is a member of an acting group called the Lord Chamberlain's Men, okay? That acting group is patronized, supported by the Lord Chamberlain. The Lord Chamberlain is essentially the second most powerful person in England. This is the person who keeps all the queens appointments, is her right-hand man, etc. All right? There's people in this group that are going to become, that are going to stay in the group when it takes a new name, when Queen Elizabeth dies. Um, they are going to be, some of those men are going to be the people who produce what's called the first folio, which we'll talk about in just a minute. The Lord's Chamber, Lord Chamberlain's men are putting on plays in London. It's thought they might have traveled around some throughout England, not Europe or anything like that, okay? So, I'm gonna skip over that for a minute and we come over here to these days. 1575, 76, my memory's telling me it's 76. A man named Got to get the right one. And I'm not going to, so I'm only going to get his last name. Burbage. It's either Thomas or James. I can't remember who the father is. Erects a building. Okay. In Shoreditch. Shoreditch is an area of, of London. It's still there, this area, Shoreditch. Okay? He erects a building, erects a building designed for putting on plays. What would we call that kind of building? A theater. That's what he named it. He just named it the theater. Okay? He erects it on land that he leases. He owns the building. The landowner owns the land that it's on. Okay. In 1599, the lease comes due. He's either got to buy the land or the building on it becomes the landowner's building. So, the Lord Chamberlain's men hire, I believe this is the somebody to dismantle the theater and move it. They take it apart, timber by timber, and they move it to south of the River Thames. And they move it to the area called Southwark, okay? 
Sometimes you'll see it spelled with an E. Okay? They move it there for a very specific reason. Mid-1590s, plague hits London. And one of the first things the mayor of London does is he closes all the theaters. Why? Because the theaters, man, you've got 1,500, 2,000 people packed in tightly. Plague spreads wildly. So he closes all the theaters. His jurisdiction only goes to the bank of the River Thames. Thames runs through London like this, has several loops. So his only covers the northern part. South of the River Thames, he has no authority over. So they have the globe reconstructed south of the River Thames. There's a couple of other playhouses there by this time. One's named the Swan. Another one begins with a D, I can't remember. Okay. Um, the original foundations for this were discovered in late 1990s. They were doing work for an office or apartment block, and they were discovered underneath an apartment building. I think you can go and walk and look at the big pit. In around 1593, an American filmmaker named Sam Wanamaker started building a version of the globe in Southern. You can go visit it today. It is an exact replica. I was there in 1595 with a group of students. When they hadn't yet finished it, we got to take a tour and watch them, you know, doing some things, etc. They've only made two changes. So I, I said it's an exact replica. It's an exact replica on the outside and how it looks. Two changes, though. One, the seating, the benches, are built to accommodate people our size. Because we are larger than the Elizabethans were. I mean, the average height for an Elizabethan male, if I remember right, was something like 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. The United States average height for a male is like 5'10", 5'9", to 5'11", something like that, right? So we're quite a bit bigger. We're also a little bit wider, okay? Um, the other thing is the roof. This was a thatched roof. The globe burned down in 1612. They were doing a production, I think, of uh, Henry VIII, fired off a cannon, blank shot, but the wadding inside the cannon barrel shot out, landed on the roof, and the thing burned down. I think it is in something like three hours. There was no globe from that point until I believe it opened in 1997, okay? Seen a bunch of plays at the Globe. If you go to the Globe today, um, you can see performances done in Elizabethan attire and according to Elizabethan pronunciation, so Shakespeare's language. You'll see a lot of modern stuff, a lot of crazy stuff. Um, one thing that I really like that they still do is there's no sound amplification. So when a character speaks, you're hearing just that person's voice from wherever you are sitting, okay? And one thing about the theater, or the globe, okay? It's shaped like a, oh, if I remember right, it's got 22 actual sides. So it's not a circle, truly. The stage comes out like this. You've got the tiring house back here. This is where this is mentioned in the introduction. This is where characters change costumes and come in and out of onto the stage. Okay? The stage is about 42 feet width, and I think it's 24 feet depth. The stage has two big columns okay, that hold a roof over most of it. All right? This is where the gallery singing is. You've got three levels. One's right on top of the other, all right? This is what's called the yard. This is what, this is where groundlings stood. People would pay a penny 
to come in and see a play, and they would stand here. Okay? It wasn't paint, just had dirt and sawdust and such like that on it. And from accounts that we have, surviving accounts of people who tended the place, if the play wasn't liked, if the play wasn't well done, people would scoop up whatever's on the ground and throw it at the actors. Okay? Give you an example of what was on the ground. Men, I'm not sure about the women, men would relieve themselves just standing right there. Drop their britches and, and so there would be raw sewage. And sometimes that would be picked up and thrown at the actors. So what does that make the actors want to do? Put on a really good play. And it makes the playwright, if the playwright is one of the actors, which Shakespeare was. You were the Lord Chamberlain's men. They incorporated, that is, they created a corporation also with this name. Shakespeare was a stockholder in that corporation. He got a percentage of the receipts from every performance, as did the other major playwrights who were stockholders. So again, you don't want to write any plays that bomb because you want people to keep coming back. And they would do plays sometimes during the fair weather months, twice a day, afternoon and evening. Okay. Um, that's enough about that stuff. So, <clears throat> during the, let's say roughly the years from 1590 to 1612, so that's 22 years. So let's put 22 years. Shakespeare writes four long poems. These are several hundred lines long, all right? 154 sonnets. We're going to read two or three of his sonnets. Sonnets are 14 line poems. Do the math. That's well over 1,500 lines. In 37 plays that he writes himself, he also helps a couple of other writers with their plays, okay? In 22 years. Leave all this stuff along, alone and just look at those plays. That's one and a half of these plays every year. Not little short one act plays, not little 20 minute plays or 30 minute plays or three act plays. These are five act full length minimum production time of two to three hours. If you were to perform all of Hamlet, okay, or all of King Lear, and not take anything out, you're talking about four hours. That doesn't include intermission, which they would usually have, all right? One and a half of those every year. 22 years and maybe with a couple exceptions none of these plays by Shakespeare is quote-unquote bad he has a lot of contemporaries who wrote bad plays I mean bad not technically proficient not beautiful not moving etc etc okay every one of Shakespeare's plays will rile you up one way or another It'll make you feel really good, it'll make you angry, it'll make you upset, it'll make you sad, things like that, okay? Two other, three other things. When Queen Elizabeth dies in 1503, the Lord Chamberlain's men become the King's men because King James IV of Scotland becomes King James, excuse me, King James VI of Scotland becomes King James I of England. And so what had been supported by the Lord Chamberlain, now they get the patronage of the king. And that kind of means, and even with the Lord Chamberlain's men, it kind of meant if people had problems with the plays, they had to be very careful about what they said because of the person who supported them, the person who stood behind them and said, so-and-so has my voice of approval, right? Um, now, 
this first. First folio. I've got one in my office. I got, I've got a facsimile of the first folio in my office. I, I might bring it in sometime. The first folio is the first collected edition of most of the plays by Shakespeare. It doesn't have all of them. All right? It's printed in 1623. Notice Shakespeare dies in 1660, seven years after his death. Some of his plays are printed, published, during his lifetime. We don't know that Shakespeare is behind any of those publications. That is, we don't know that Shakespeare actually took his manuscripts to a printer and had them printed. It's thought that most of those were probably printed without his approval, without his permission. Somebody got a hold of manuscripts, or somebody got hold of a copy book, the kind of text that actors have so as they're preparing a play for a production, that somebody got hold of one of those, took it to the printer, etc. Which is why, for several, many of Shakespeare's plays, you've got some variations between the surviving copies. Right? This, and the fact that it's published in 1623, seven years after Shakespeare's death, has led to some questions and fueled some speculation regarding did the Shakespeare who was born and died in Stratford upon Avon write the plays that are attributed to him? It's called the authorship question. I just answered a survey less than a week ago online, some publication, you know, since I teach a course in Shakespeare. You know, do you discuss the authorship issue and et cetera? And I said, yes. The authorship question is essentially revolves around the assertion that somebody, for one, born in Stratford-upon-Avon, which in Shakespeare's England, Stratford-upon-Avon would be to London like what would be to New York City or Washington, D.C., culturally? London, you know, the cultural capital of England at the time. New York, Washington, D.C., maybe L.A., cultural capital of the United States. Stratford-upon-Avon to London would be like what to L.A., New York, D.C.? See the analogy I'm drawing? It'd be like Woodbury, or Smyrna, or Laverne, or Hohenwald, or Lewisburg. What's the point? Really, are you gonna get a major writer? Are you going to get a brilliant thinker from one of those places and not from London? So part of this, the, the the assertion that Shakespeare from Stratford couldn't have been the author, as I wrote in this survey, it's an elitist idea. Only someone who had been in and lived in and grew up in London could have written these plays. That's part of it. The second part is only somebody who had attended a university could have written these plays. As far as we know, Shakespeare never attended a university. As far as we know, Shakespeare never went beyond what we would kind of call the sixth grade. He attended the King Edward VI school in, Strat in Stratford. We think there's not an actual record of him on the roll, but a lot of the rolls are incomplete during his lifetime. Okay? There's anecdotal evidence, and the earliest person who wrote about Shakespeare's life said he did. Okay. Here's the thing about attending that grammar school during Shakespeare's day. By the time you would leave that grammar school at the age of 12 or so, you would have learned definitely as much Latin, probably as much Greek, as a college student majoring in classics. 
classics, Latin and Greek. Four years college education. Like Swanee has a classics major, a newest student who done that. Shakespeare would have had that much Latin and Greek by the age of 12. He would have started around the age of six. Instruction would have begun in English, but it would have gradually moved to Latin and Greek so that by the time of his last two or three years, all of the instruction would have been in Latin and Greek. There's a school that's just been started in Savannah. It's a new, it's a new college. And when they offer courses in Latin and Greek, they, if I remember right, they have about a three or four week introduction to the rudiments of the language. And then from that point on, it's all conducted in that language, either Latin or Greek, depending on what those two languages. So Shakespeare would have known a lot of Latin and Greek. Why is that important? Some of his sources were only available in Latin or Greek. One of his sources, Midsummer Night's Dream, for Midsummer Night's Dream, was only available in French. People who question the authorship say, Shakespeare didn't know French. We don't know that he didn't know French. One of the ideas about what Shakespeare was doing during this seven year period, and this was an idea floated in that early biography in the very early 1700s, is that Shakespeare traveled the continent. He did what you know, later gets called the Grand Tour. He goes and he goes to Italy, he goes to Spain, he goes to France, he goes to Germany. Well, someone with Shakespeare's linguistic facility, he makes up over 1,600 of the words that he uses. He's the first one to use them, okay? Someone with that kind of linguistic ability probably picked up languages very easily, okay? And if he had learned Latin and Greek, especially Latin, he'd be able to pick up any Romance language like French, like Italian, like Spanish, because they're just bad Latin. They're devolved Latin, right? I think it's a bunch of bunk. That is, I don't think there's good, there are good reasons to question whether or not Shakespeare wrote the plays. I think there are good reasons to assert that he did. There are clues in the language of the language is, I should say, of the text that show Warwickshire dialect. That is words only used in Warwickshire, England. Warwickshire is where Shakespeare was from. Stratford-on-Avon is in the middle of the county of Warwick. Okay? So, having said all that, I'm just seeing if there's anything more. Uh, when I mentioned the two Burbages, and again, I can't remember which is which, and, and one of them may be Richard. I'll have to double check that, and, and I'll talk about it on, today's Friday, on Monday. Uh, one of these guys was one of his members' co-actors. In fact, we're, we know Shakespeare wrote some of his characters for this guy to perform. He was... So well-known, well-loved. And that's because we have a lot of writing about the theater in Shakespeare's day from that period. If you ever saw Shakespeare in Love, as an example, you, you meet a character named by Jeffrey, played by Jeffrey Rush named Philip Henslow. Henslow was a producer manager of a, another acting company called the Admiral's Men. He kept a diary of all the plays going on in London. We have that diary. It tells you the plays he saw by Shakespeare. He comments about them. Kind of like, I wish Shakespeare was writing for us, okay? It's even thought that he sent spies to rehearsals of Shakespeare's plays to copy down the plays as they're being performed. So that his, there was no copyright, no plagiarism at the time, right? What do you have? 10 minutes left. So, read over these notes very well. The terms, etc. Because we're going to talk about asides and soliloquies 
and I'll talk about them as we get to them. So, Midsummer Night's Dream. 1180-1181. You go to London any summer. Any summer. And you will be able to see multiple productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream. For the simple reason, it is one of, if not the best loved of all of Shakespeare's comedies. Okay? It starts, like I said, when we were discussing tragedy, comedies begin. You begin with a rupture in society, okay? And you get this kind of fall or falling action. And at the climax, it can become a tragedy or at that point can really become a comedy where society starts to be repaired. The general overall story of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream is you have a man named Aegeus, he's mentioned on page 1181, who has a daughter named Hermia. He wants Hermia to marry a man named Demetrius. She doesn't love Demetrius. She loves a man named Lysander. There's your conflict. She loves somebody who her father doesn't want her to marry. Okay. That creates the opening rupture in society. All right. That's one plot. Another plot is you have the Duke of Athens, whose name is Theseus, old Greek mythological hero. I don't mean old in the play. I mean, this guy goes way back, kind of like Oedipus. Okay. He's getting married, getting ready to marry Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons. So who knows anything about the Amazons? What were they? Tribe of women, warrior tribe, who use men sexually, solely, so that the tribe will go on to produce more women, and the men were slaves, so if they had a boy, that boy would grow up to become essentially a slave of the women, etc. They were so fierce, they were archers, that they would cut off their left breast so that when drawing a bow and arrow, when they released that arrow, the string wouldn't hit the breast. I mean, that's some mental fortitude, right? Theseus has defeated Hippolyta in war. So she's got to marry him, okay? Kind of a, another plot. So you have that couple, and then you have the Hermia, whichever of the two men couple, and then we also have the fairies, okay? And the fairies are led by King Oberon, who is married to Titania, his wife. And there's conflict there. Because Oberon wants a little boy that Titania has that she got from a woman who was devoted to her, an Indian woman, who died. And so she, raised, she took the little boy and is raising him to be a follower in her retinue. And her husband, Oberon, wants the boy to be in his retinue. So they're like this. So notice you have three marriage slash love conflicts of sorts. The theseus Hippolyta one is the one that's hardest to see because they don't seem to be loggerheads. But it happens very early in the, poem, uh, in the play. And then you have another group of characters okay, that are on top of 1182 that are called variously the clowns, the rustics, or the rude mechanicals. These are guys who spend their days working with their hands. You have a tinker, a joiner, a joiner's a woodworker, um, a bellows mender, um, a tailor, and various other things, okay? They are there for comedic relief but also because things that happen with them help emphasize some of the other action in the play. 
So notice right away, if you remember the other day when we were talking about tragedy stuff, I had Aristotle, and Aristotle's three unities written down here. Unity of time, unity of place, unity of action. Unity of time happens within 24 hours. We're going to be told immediately, opening lines, at least four days are going to pass. So unity of time, out the window. Unity of place, there are two settings within this play. The city of Athens, and court of Athens, same thing, and a wood or forest outside Athens. Unity of place, out the door. Unity of action, we have at least three plots. Why? Probably Shakespeare didn't know Aristotle. And, and writers prior to Shakespeare weren't familiar with the unities. Writers after Shakespeare, 17th, 18th century writers, kind of knock Shakespeare and his contemporaries for not following the three unities. Because these later writers are trying to go back to ancient classical Greece as the model and such. Okay? So, all background. Four minutes to go. Act one. Notice, scene, Athens, Theseus's court. So Theseus, Hippolyta, and a bunch of others come in. And Theseus addresses his fiance. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial, our nuptial hour draws on apace. It's coming. Four happy days bring in another new moon. But oh, methinks how slow the old moon wanes. It'll be four days and there's a new moon. He's implying we're going to get married when the new moon comes. But what has he said about the passage of time? Methinks how slow this old moon wanes. Why does he talk about the moon being slow to wane, for the, to go completely dark for the new moon to come in? What's his point? I imagine if you're not married and you plan to get married, the closer and closer you get to the actual wedding date, what happens? It slows down. Why? Because you want it to speed up. You want to get to that date. She, the moon, lingers my desires like to a stepdame or a dowager long withering out a young man's revenue. She is, she, the moon, is taking her own sweet time. Okay? Hippolyta. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. She's kind of suggesting time's not going slow enough. Time's going to... Four nights will quickly... And we get the first use of the word in the play. Dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, now bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. That is, and then the new moon will behold, what? Our wedding revelries. The ceremony and the party that goes on afterwards. Okay? Four nights will quickly dream away the time. What does that mean, to dream away the time? Have you ever either looked forward to or dreaded something coming up in a few days, a week, whatever? And it finally arrives, and it is gone. And what does it seem like the time leading up to it was like? A dream. Why? Because once it's passed, it's like, well, that went by quickly. Can, can we come, go back to it? Can we go back to it and slow it down and let it? That's her point. It's going to seem like when we reach our actual wedding day, boom, time has flown by. So Theseus then gives an order to philostrate or philostrophe, however you want to pronounce the name. Stir up the Athenian youth. Why? We want to have a party. We want to have a big party. And we want the Athenian youth to put on plays and juggling stuff and dumb shows, all the kinds of like carnival stuff, okay? 
So Aegeus comes in with his daughter and Lysander and Demetrius. And he addresses them. And Theseus says, what's new? What's up? And he says, I come full of vexation with complaint against my daughter. We'll have to stop there because it's 8.55. So um, even though it's pretty long, I'm going to try, well, take that back. Not going to try. We're going to do Act 1 on Monday. Remember, quiz due tonight. Okay. I don't know that I'll put a physical or email announcement out. 